take my body home Well, well, well So I can die easy Well, well, well So I can die easy Well, well, well So I can die easy Jesus, won't you make a man Jesus, won't you make a man Jesus, won't you make a man Die in bed I'd always wanted to come to Mississippi and I always wanted to see this area we just felt like maybe getting the farthest away. We've been in New York and LA, and I thought, you know, where can we go to really clear our heads and figure out what, what we're gonna do with this record, and what we wanna do as far as career-wise. And I thought, well, we helped go hold up in the shack in Mississippi and figure it out. It'd probably be as, as wise as anything. Meet me on Jesus, meet me. Meet me up in the air. If thy wing should fail me, Lord, won't you bring me another pair? Well, 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 so I can die easy. Well, 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 so I can die easy. Well, 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 so I can die easy. Jesus, won't you make a man? Jesus, won't you make a man? Jesus, won't you make a man? Die. I think the thing that connects me most to the Delta, probably more than anything, is the songwriting. The way the gospel intertwines with juke joints, the way the Saturday night kind of lays her head on Sunday morning's pella. Never seems out of place for the early Delta singers to sing about salvation on cut one and killing a man on cut two. The Delta has a long history in rhythms and, and uh, all kinds of music. Uh, the reality is we're just all kind of playing the same beats. It's just, you know, how you put your soul and your, your uh, you know, whatever handiwork God has put in your life, how you somehow get that to transfer into what you're playing. We had toured across the country and done week-long showcases in Los Angeles and New York City. We were still confused on what to do with the album. We were looking at a table with two record contracts on it, the place I'd always dreamed about, but nothing seemed right. One contract would send us to Europe for 18 months away from our families. The second contract we renegotiated for months, but after thousands of dollars in lawyer fees, they still had their hand in every aspect of our career, including dictating how many songs on the album would have religious overtones. I wasn't prepared to budge on the things that I felt made the cold stairs the cold stairs, and having religious and southern themes in the music was the connection that brought me to the Delta to begin with. And after New York City, man, were we glad to be back in the South. A record deal. I mean, it's kind of like the Super Bowl of the World Series. When you decide you're going to be a professional musician, it's the thing that brings validation to your art. At least that's the perception up until a year or two ago. I started playing music at the age of five. Mixed the Jerry Lee Lewis and Jimmy Swaggart with my granddad in front of the TV. I really can't remember a time that I wasn't playing music inside my head. Brian and I had met early on at a music store and hit it off, put together a band that won some contest. We ended up showcasing for Island Records. Very excited at the time, and we thought we really had a shot, but after it fell through, at this stage in the game, we both thought it was about time to hang up aspirations of ever making a living playing music. After about three months of not touching the guitars or the drums, both of us were restless, thought it was time to jam. That was the start of the cold stairs. We had no goals, no calculations. I had a business trip to Memphis and Brian came down with me. We sat in an arcade cafe downtown and decided if we ever played music out again, 
We'd only do something that we both enjoyed regardless of any success or lack of it. From our first gig out, from the first moment the entire rig kicked in in the club, we saw people's reactions, saw the cold stares. We knew we'd probably have some luck if we took it out of town. Like my dad would always say, take it to Nashville and see how you fare against the pros. Fast forward a year. We've been playing around Nashville a lot and have been invited by the Hard Rock Cafe to be a part of the Ambassadors of Rock International Contest. When we first started looking at Hard Rock Rising, the global battle of the bands for Hard Rock uh, International, uh, I was looking at the, a lot of the artists that were, that were submitting to be a part of it uh, for Nashville's execution of the battle of the bands. And I reached out to the cold stairs and was like, you know, guys, you got to shot at this I mean we're not allowed to have favorites but I was quietly like come on guys come on and uh, you know next thing you know they blew the judges away blew the audience away uh, we were packing the house every night and it's just screaming raving fans that were going crazy about these guys the cold stares that you know at that time you know not a lot of people knew about they're one of 10 national finalists for the Hard Rock Cafe's Ambassadors of Rock 2010. The Cold Stairs could be headed to London to represent Music City at the U and the USA. Hard Rock is calling. Now they're here to perform for us this morning and ask for your vote. We're going to tell you how you can do that in just a second. Please welcome the Cold Stairs. We never intended on winning the Hard Rock Cafe contest. We were just happy for an opportunity to play at the time. But somehow we did. We ended up finishing second nationally out of thousands of bands. Within weeks, our fan base had exploded and we found ourselves on television and radio across the country. It was a pivotal moment for the Cold Stairs. After the Hard Rock Cafe contest, we were at a point where we thought we should go in the studio and make a proper record. We booked two days at House of David studio in Nashville and somehow managed to track and record 15 songs. We were excited we knocked it out so easily. We finished up some overdubs and started looking at a release date. Little did we know we were heading into uncharted waters. Our engineer on the album took the music on a trip to LA and played the tunes for some record executives without telling us. The record labels became interested in what they heard and started trying to contact us. But now our engineer thought he should have a piece of the pie. It was more like most of the pie. This started a year-long legal fight for us to release the record we basically made ourselves in two days. We finally got to a point where we almost had the album in our hands. We had a high-powered entertainment lawyer and we had showcased for two major record labels that had flown in to see our shows. Our wildest dreams were about to come true and that's when the nightmare happened. I'd had a lump on my arm that had been removed. Two days before you'd show in Nashville, my doctors informed me that I had cancer. I needed immediate surgery. I told them I needed the weekend for a final gig and we played a show at 12th and Porter that Saturday night while I wondered if I'd ever be on stage again. Treatment began, months of radiation, chemotherapy. It almost killed me, but I kept my faith in God and I knew he had a vision for my life that didn't include checking out yet. I just never lost faith that I would play again. And by the grace of God, my body began to heal. And although I was covered in hives from treatment, we entered the studio with our friend Greg Pierce and finished mixing the tracks that would eventually be a cold, wet night in the Howlin' Wind. We released the album and toured. And we toured some more. We played festivals and shows across the country. We had some great national magazine reviews, even spent a few weeks at number one on the Amazon Blues and Rock charts. We eventually sold around 25,000 copies. But by now, the A&R reps from the labels that had been interested in us before had all been fired. Streaming was becoming mainstream and the music industry was falling apart. We were back at square one. We had sent off some tracks to a few industry people that we felt like we would want to work with if we ever took another run at a record deal. We just felt like having someone on the inside we trusted would quicken the process and help us make the right decisions. 
We'd fired our old lawyer who had lost interest during my bout with cancer. We hired attorney John Strom, who immediately helped us start turning the ship around. My friend Zach had mentioned Mark Needham to us. Mark had signed the Killers, Imagine Dragons. He had worked with Fleetwood Mac and a lot of folks we admired. He contacted us back after hearing the tracks and we started a dialogue about working together. John suggested we work with him in the studio to test chemistry prior to signing any deals. So Mark flew into Nashville. We went into Blackbird Studios and cut a couple songs to see how it felt working together. Mark has that Einstein simplicity. Of, uh, he'll say stuff like, um, no, nah, don't play that fill in, play the good one. And then, you know, 20 fill ins later, yeah, that's the one, you know. We hit it right off. We stopped looking around and we ended up signing a production deal with Mark. In the past five years, we had lost dogs, grandmothers, mothers. We'd been divorced. I'd battled cancer. Anything and everything that could derail this band had been thrown at us, and yet here we were. Recording in a mansion in Hollywood Hills, hanging out on the Sunset Strip, fast cars, drums, and guitars. After surviving what we had, including cancer, you don't pass up on these opportunities, and we didn't. One of the best times of both of our lives. We finished the album and we knew we had something. And sure enough, the labels came knocking again. shopping around a little bit and we had uh, two record contracts that were on the table at the time uh, you know we both really wanted to sign a deal just to have some kind of redemption and be able to call our friends and family and and say we had signed a deal we had industry our, our team that we've been working with all knew we had offers you know, it was basically financial suicide for us. Mark had spent about six months negotiating the contracts. We'd spent all kinds of money on lawyer fees. We still couldn't get there. The record deals were better, but neither one of them got us to a place where we felt secure. I had a dream about Robert Johnson in Mississippi, and I called Brian uh, the next morning. I said, listen, man, did a little research this morning. I found a place for us to crash in Mississippi. Let's not sign a deal right now. Let's hold off. I know it's, we've negotiated this stuff for six months but let's take let's take a few weeks let's go to Mississippi let's crash let's visit some grave sites let's play some juke joints let's just get back to where we started and then let's make a decision with a clear conscience and what's best for the band what's best for our families so we called uh, Greg Pierce and we got a camera crew and just in case we you know something would come of it and we headed to Mississippi and I think in the end we we got the clarification that we wanted, but we also ended up really just finding ourselves again.
We made it to uh, Robert Johnson's grave, which he's got a couple down there, but we, we made it to the church and, you know, it's just so weird, especially with, uh, you know, on the new EP, us having to see that my grave's kept clean and walking up on Robert's grave and, and seeing, you know, whiskey bottles, guitar picks, slides, personal notes. and Once we got there, there was such a, a, a heaviness to the area. Uh, I can see how those songs that came out of there were uh, why they were so heavy and sad and dark. And at one point, you know, we walked right behind the grave. There's some, there's some coffins that have come up out of the ground, and we walked over the back hill, and you're right there, and the muddy water's right behind there, and the river's flowing. And we walked back up to the church and um, sat down on the front of the church. And actually, the church is only open like one Sunday a month, and there's doors on the front that are barred almost like a liquor store or something. It's locked up to keep people out, but we're sitting there playing and I noticed Greg kept kind of turning his head towards me and the door and while we're playing, those doors were just, it was, it was like air was getting sucked in the church and opening. And I noticed it too, and I, you know, I'm sure there's some natural uh, explanation for it, but man, it was just a, just a heaviness. Um, just being there. I've never cared about what what label any album was on or where they were in their career or any of that. In hindsight, maybe some of that's interesting, but for this band, it's always been about the journey, you know? 20 years from now, when we look back on this, it's about the experiences we had, not about what the, the barcode was on the back of the album. You know, at this point in our career and really in the music industry right now, all you have is is your integrity and, and really the choices that you make on the people that you work with. And we're going to spend 2015 on the road touring behind these EPs and hopefully our fans enjoy it as much as we do and, and we hope to see everybody out on the road. Jesus had a brother named James, James was just a kid. The same last name No matter how he tried to get ahead James never raised a man From the dead he said Mama won't you tell me please Why nobody ever gave a damn about me Oh, when you get up to the pearly gates Please don't forget about your Your brother James Lazarus, he laid there undisturbed. Jesus.